So I'm very pleased to introduce next um, Professor Dr. Elizabeth Price, who is Professor of Fine Art at Kingston University. A Turner Prize winner, she creates short videos which explore the social and political histories of artifacts, architectures, and documents. The subject matter may be sometimes historic artworks of great cultural significance, but it is more frequently marginal or derogated things and often pop culture or mass produced objects. The video narrations draw upon and satirize the administrative vernaculars of relevant public and academic institutions, as well as advertising copy and other texts of private and commercial organizations. She has exhibited in group ex exhibitions internationally and has had solo exhibitions at Tate Britain, the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, Chicago Art Institute, uh, the Julia Stoschek Foundation, Dusseldorf, the Baltic at Newcastle. And in 2012, she was awarded the Turner Prize for her video installation, The Woolworth's Choir of 1979. In 2013, Elizabeth won the Contemporary Art Society Annual Award with the Ashmolean and Pitt Rivers Museum, Oxford. So we are very fortunate and very pleased to welcome you today, Elizabeth. Thank you. Hello, thank you very much. It's a pleasure um, to be with you all here today. And thank you very much to Simon. I really enjoyed your presentation. I'm just gonna share my uh, screen now as I have um, a PowerPoint to show you. Um, Brilliant, we can see it. Great, thanks. Although I'm going to speak as an artist, I'm not going to reflect on my work as an artist here, but focus instead upon my role in academia and bring together some of the ideas and arguments I have used in the past as part of what I regard as advocacy for artists in the context of research. I will focus in particular upon an argument for an emancipatory, an emancipatory expansion of the forms that research can take. Research in the humanities in the UK is generally conducted with a presupposition that successful projects rely upon a fixed invariable form for their expression. This being the academic thesis with its narrow and particular form upheld by unstated convention, as well as by explicit regulation. I'm going to argue that the very conservatism of form that humanities disciplines regard as the guarantor of quality actually inhibits work of significance within the discipline of art. In the course of this, I will briefly reflect on the institutional history that led us here to the point where the thesis required for a PhD in art may offer a more coherent educational progression from a bachelor's degree in philosophy than from a master's degree in art. I will assess the consequences of this disenfranchisement, for that is what it is, which generally demotes the knowledge that graduates of art have and particularly frustrates the key critical understandings and agencies of an art education of questioning the form that things and ideas may take. I would like to apply those understandings and agencies here and consider this conservation of the form of the academic thesis within the context of intellectual debates around formal innovations in art and specifically painting. The form of painting is historically contested, but it is arguably the case that innovations within and challenges to painting's form have actually sustained its cultural significance. Paintings continued intellectual vitality as thought, as knowledge, and as art has relied upon the form itself, or relied upon the fact that the form itself is not institutionally preserved, but available for continual reinvention and so has for many years been an expanded or porous category, including many varied kinds of art making. Its definition has sometimes been so dissolved as to even allow the purposeful inclusion within an intellectual category of painting. Many things that are not in any literal sense, paintings do not look like paintings, employ the con conventional constituent elements of painting or any of its established techniques or processes. To aid this argument, I could cite many artworks but will for now summon up 
the memory of Susan Hiller's burnt paintings, which are meaningful within the history of painting, but also in related histories of sculpture, performance and conceptual art. It is a measure of their significance, not lack of clarity, purpose or concision, but they speak to all these contexts. These are artworks that constitute thoughts about art. They help us think about art's boundaries, definitions and categories. They make an argumentative proposition for how art might be made and, sus and sustain philosophical and political implications of that possibility for art and artists and more broadly. One of these implications is that the meaningful formulation of an idea may depend upon a radical formal innovation, which is to say that some ideas can only be conceived through processes of formal invention, as well as being best expressed through them. The artist who made the work in question came from a group, women, who had been notably excluded from participation in the established history of the form painting specifically and visual art generally. I would argue it was intellectually necessary for Hiller to innovate with the form precisely because of the historic exclusion of women from its development. So am I saying that a burnt thesis could be a thesis? That's not as provocative a, a suggestion as it first seems. Hiller didn't destroy paintings. She stated the point of burning them was not to end or erase them, but transform them. The ashes are painting and not. They are former paintings and putative ones. The category itself shifts like smoke and the strange physical marker of that disorientation, the bottled ashes, invite us to imagine a ritual of formal transformation in which grief, fury and wit all have a place along with a kind of rational optimism. In a similar spirit, I'm saying that the normative form of the academic thesis may need to undergo a similar transformation if it is to make sense within the social, political and intellectual histories of art making and art education. Moreover, I think the fact that art artists and art academics have been largely excluded from the development of academic forms for research means that now that they slash we are invited to participate, no one should be surprised if we find the need to innovate in order to make the context meaningful for our thinking processes and ideas. It is my view that art pursued at the advanced level commensurate with PhD should seize the form of the thesis and experiment with it, that within the context of the discipline of art, this kind of thinking about form is necessary for advanced work to take place, and that in principle, projects which do this should be welcomed as research. I'm not sure that these suggestions should be at all shocking, it seems fairly reasonable that extending our education into PhD should build upon its own pedagogic practices and the intellectual cultures of making art that pre-existed the institution of PhD in the subject. The discipline of art is a relative newcomer to the context of academic research and the terms of its admission have been largely derived from neighboring disciplines of art history, cultural theory and philosophy. Indeed, the model of the thesis required from artists undertaking research in their own disciplinary areas is largely derived from these contexts. The fact that this model does not also draw precedence from other, well, not so frequently, from other relevant established research disciplines, one that, ones that have always incorporated practice elements, such as certain areas of science and social science, is instructive. It points to an accident of history rooted in the institutional politics of art departments during the corporatized expansion of higher education. Faced with developing research degrees from scratch at speed, art departments allocated the very challenging task of determining exactly what form doctorates in art should take to those staff in the department who already had PhDs. These were usually the staff with responsibility for providing the historical and theoretical elements of the course and supervising essays. They were not always artists, and had often had not studied art in higher education. More importantly, in many instances, they had limited direct experience of teaching, examining and assessing art. Meanwhile, art ac artist academics at these institutions often declined to contribute. It's worth remembering here that of course, doctorates in the history of art and cultural theory were long established and that new research degrees proposed within art departments were not intended to reproduce research already possible in other departments. Doctorates in art were intended to offer new 
and distinct routes for students completing BAs and MAs in art, wishing to take their study to a more advanced level. These degrees were also intended to enable new and distinct contributions to the discipline of art, and like any university research, influence related institutions, organizations, debates and practices beyond the university. The hasty and pragmatic development of doctorates in art described above originally resulted in a somewhat unsophisticated disciplinary compromise, a sort of joint honours degree at PhD level, in which the thesis was made up of half of a standard humanities PhD, along with some art. Even more problematically, a clear hierarchy was soon established between these two elements, with the results that only the written element was seriously supported and properly examined. Where that occurred, the half of the thesis derived from humanities disciplines generally reproduced recognized standards of scholarship associated with that discipline, underpinned by academic regulation. Meanwhile, the half of the thesis made up of some art generally did not re reproduce similarly recognized standards of scholarship in art. Often little or no specific regulation or expectation was established for the artwork submission in contrast with other pre-existing art degrees. Usually there was no opportunity to publicly present or exhibit the project. The artwork for created for PhD in such circumstances was often less significant than that submitted at MA. This is not a criticism of the candidates themselves, but of the institutions and departments failing to provide the educational support and resources we know that is necessary for making art. As an academic supervising PhDs in art over the last 15 years, it has not been unusual to be asked to, ad to admit or upgrade a candidate without considering their artwork. I have examined candidates who were unaware that their art had any value in the examination. I've assessed PhDs in which the proposed library record, the material held by the university library as a complete record of the research project for the benefit of future researchers, included no reference to any related artwork made by the candidate as part of the project. Indeed, in some universities I've worked in, the majority of the theses submitted for doctorates in art include no record of any of the artistic work that comprises half of the thesis. The only way you can tell they are art PhDs is because they're half the size of a humanities PhD. The other half is missing, invisible, erased. Let's return to Susan Hiller's asserted transformation of her paintings into ashes. One of the rhetorical devices of the work is to invoke the shock of a violent erasure. The burning of artifacts or records generally implies a censorious and repressive act of cultural violence, or perhaps less frequently, a revolutionary gesture of protest. But Hiller moves us on from an assessment of her attitude towards painting by insisting that the act of burning here is not one of erasure. She asks us to accept that she is merely altering the form of the painting. Having, in, having enjoined us to consider its destruction, she offers something generative, something else. By contrast, the form of the thesis that many candidates pursuing doctorates in art have historically been obliged to work within simply institutes an erasure. As an artist who works with libraries, archives and collections, and more particularly within their silences, omissions and elisions, this oversight is unforgivable. It is politically reprehensible, but also academically inept within the context of good practice in PhD research, where great emphasis is placed upon the integrity of the thesis as a complete document of the knowledge of the project and its sources for the benefit of future researchers in the discipline. Whilst many institutions have moved on significantly from this record of poor practice, it has had an enduring impact, limiting the quality of artistic work at PhD level, inhibiting the potential of research degrees to generate and capture knowledge about artistic practice, the distinctive possibility of, of such research, and impeding the critical influence of academia upon the wider context of art. In the light of this, a critical transformation of academic forms, <clears throat> in keeping perhaps with Hiller's transformation of painting, is not only justified, but necessary. 
It is worth remembering that whilst this is a thesis, a thesis isn't necessarily this. Let's remember a thesis is an argument, a proposition. It has no given or essential form. Susan Hiller's work is, of course, a thesis. It makes an argument, formulates a proposition. Indeed, it makes an argument about form itself. So let's enact both the knowledge and the findings of Hiller's thesis upon this form. Let's, in, let's exercise a dematerialization. Let's detach that idea, the idea of a proposition, from essential connection to this. And let's reconstitute it using other things to provide a more effective medium for artistic work in the context of research. If I were to reconstitute it, if I were to reconstitute it, it would not be a singular thing. My proposition for a thesis would need to be made up of many things, and those things would vary in kind. For example, it would include both art and writing. To better express the full implications of this, I need to replace the image of the book as the natural medium of the thesis, which implies not just the primacy of writing, but of a singularity of form. I want to visualize something else that will help me convey a proposition made up of separate and different things. The art form of installation will be useful here. The installation is a single composition made up of many, many elements, not subsumed into one literal artifact. Of course, this kind of artwork exists not only in the collection of elements themselves, but in their interrelation. It is dependent upon them all, in fact, but also upon that which exists immaterially between them, those possibilities of thought created only in their conjunction. I propose the relationship between writing and art and my proposition accordingly. But this art that I make may incorporate a complex range of different kinds of objects and artifacts. Most artistic practices include diverse things, employing multiple technologies, processes, and distinct, distinct forms. If I were to do a PhD now, it would probably be conducted through moving image artworks comprised of many different digital elements, but also separately depend upon analog photographic artworks and literal, literal collages and small handmade sculptures. Of course, while writing generally depends upon fewer technologies for its creation and distribution, it can also take many forms. My project would probably ne necessitate scripts for moving image, often taking song form. It's possible I would include music scores and compositions for polyphonic voice. I would use academic prose to collect information and data produced during primary social history research and secondary technical history research. I might in in include interviews and surveys and transcripts of archival materials, drawing on methods from other disciplinary contexts, such as so social science and cultural history where relevant. In order to represent and encompass such complex heterogeneity, let's now disappear the specifics of an exhibition. I want to propose the ideation of the thesis as a vessel or container, capacious and elastic, into which I can pour whatever is necessary for the project including long form prose and hours of digital video streams. But in order to avoid any austere idealization of this imaginary vessel, academia not being helped by its religious notions of virtue, I'm going to use a visual placeholder for that vessel, perhaps this immense rude ceramic pot. Whilst it is certainly necessary, it isn't sufficient for me to simply gather everything I need together but to organize the relationship, to organize the relations between those elements. For many candidates undertaking PhDs in art, it is likely that their thinking is led by the processes and experiences of making art. For me, making art is not a process of communicating things already understood, but is the means by which thoughts take shape and then may subsequently become communicable in other ways. So I would place the creation of an artwork at the center of the project at the heart of its method and as its primary manifestation. I would conceptually organize the other materials in relation to it, consider their form, function and standing within the project accordingly. And finally, I would take the imagined elastic vessel, everything it contains and the relations I've rendered between them and start to think about how it might, might take concrete distribu distributable or communicable form 
Whilst there are a number of readily available vehicles, exhibitions, publications, etc., none of them can really fully encompass the project. They could, however, reasonably provide a record of it, provided one is able to adapt the form to those ends. Each standard form will tend to promote one aspect of the project. An exhibition will favour visual materials, but obviously not preclude writing and data. A publication will favour writing and data, but obviously not preclude visual materials. Indeed, I believe the conclusion of any PhD in art should include a high profile public presentation of the artwork made and a sophisticated and comprehensive record of the project for the university library. And so we have returned to a bibliographic form, but hopefully arrive back at it differently, conceiving it as a means to record rather than to formulate or to create a proposition. Here I would perhaps draw upon the relationship between performance art and its documents in imagining the profound difference between my project as I conceive it and the form its record could take. Remembering that they are both significant in the intellectual histories of art. The record of the performance can be another thing, something else in addition to. There is also obviously a wealth of intelligent publishing material, which manages to convey the detail and complexities of artworks that are not actually presentable in that form. I would also cite Clara Weirgraf's Tilted Ark as an extraordinary document of the sculpture of that name by Richard Serra, interestingly comprised entirely of the written word. In my own record of the PhD thesis I've imagined here, I would probably incline towards creating something comprehensive, including much of the primary research and archival materials. I would attempt a thorough and precise documentation of my artwork and of key supporting materials. I would introduce all these documentary fragments by situating my project in context with relevant technical histories and histories of art and probably within the social and political histories of its likely subject matters. But I would also support people taking very different approaches whether they are more concise or more experimental. I've supervised a PhD which included no writing other than that included on a poster, a PhD composed as a violent and pornographic novel, and a PhD in which a candidate arranged for her own abduction as part of the exam process. Each of these candidates are respected artists and are now senior academics in art departments of international standing. Research forms are not natural or given. Research is an institution, and it is the responsibility of everyone involved in its endurance to politically question it. So for a brief moment, let's try to forget terms like research, capital R, and thesis, capital T, and their nominative determinism within academia. Let's consider instead an advanced academic program of education in the practice of art. The object of this program is to generate advanced work in the discipline and to widen and deepen the knowledge of the discipline. It is hoped that this high quality work and improved knowledge will have impacts beyond academia. If we were aiming to generate these outcomes, what constraints should we impose on ourselves and others? If this was your project's purpose, if this was how your project's purpose was defined, how would you approach it? What forms would it take? Thank you very much.